So we got the sound that we need. All right, I'm Dr. Matthew Chahati, PhD in bioinformatics. I got to say that slowly because I heard it last night. Of course, I've read it, but um, it's a field that I had not heard of before uh, I became familiar with Matthew. But uh, bioinformatics, which has to do with um, mathematical models, I suppose, related to the biological fields. Uh, well, like DNA sequence analysis, protein analysis, uh, like DNA sequence analysis, protein analysis. Okay, all right, those sorts of things. Bachelor of Science in Software Development. That's kind of your area, uh, at least computer science, from the University of Szeged. Is that correct in Hungary? Okay, MA in religion from Greenville Presbyterian Theological Seminary. So he is uh, not fluent in Greek and Hebrew, but he's uh, conversant in the, the biblical languages, active creation science researcher. This is all on our website, but uh, we don't always read some of the things that are posted and available to us. Active researcher in the field of creation science since 2007, has written 45 creation science papers, speaker for CMI Creation Ministries International uh, from 2019 to 2020, worked at several academic positions now in California, uh, doing again? Pharmaceutical, bioinformatics. pharmaceutical bioinformatics research company working particularly on the pandemic and the virus, the coronavirus so or not? Uh, uh, we're studying the cancer. Cancer genes, okay, excellent. And uh, he has worked in um, the assembly of the Neanderthal and Denisovian genome sequences, active in molecular baromenology research. If you heard his talk yesterday, he was defining baromenology. And if you're first checking in, uh, some of you probably know this already, most of you probably do. Bara, the Hebrew verb to create. Mean is the Hebrew verb for kind. So the study of created kinds, what that means. And without any further ado, I will turn it back over to Dr. Chahati. I apologize, folks. It's my fault. I'm going to get things. Let's hear this. Let's go over this. PowerPoint for the same. Let's just take the station. Best way to do it. Again, I'll bring it back to the Okay. Uh, so, greetings, everybody, and uh, uh, welcome back to. Um, uh, the Society of Education uh, Conference. And so this will be the second part in a two-part series on baromenology. In the previous uh, presentation, I talked about morphological baromenology, also known as classical baromenology. That's how the science uh, started. And so I'll be talking about uh, the basics of molecular baromenology, which is a field which I um, which I'm very active in. I've written a lot of papers in this sub in this newer sub branch of baromenology. And for just a few words about uh, the science itself, for those who are just joining, uh, the verse in Genesis uh, actually several verses, verses twelve and I think maybe verses twelve and um, uh, one of the other verses. They talk about how God creates different animals and plants that multiply each according to their kind. So the Genesis text doesn't mention uh, a binomial nomenclature, rather it mentions reproductive communities. That the, 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 It doesn't talk about different species, but rather about different kinds of animals or organisms which each reproduce according to their kind. So we shouldn't be forcing our modern view of taxonomy onto the biblical text, rather we should uh, perform uh, exegesis and see what the text really says about species and about organisms. So uh, last night we talked about uh, uh, morphological baromenology. Now I'll talk about molecular baromenology. Uh, also, uh, I'd like to make a few comments about uh, some things that we said uh, last night about science and about religion. 
creationism is science. Science did not begin with Darwin. Uh, we creationists, we study the handiwork of God, not the hand of God. And also, just because science studies nature only, doesn't mean that there is nature only. Doesn't exclude uh, the existence of God. Just because the focus of science is a natural world, it doesn't mean that the, the supernatural realm doesn't exist. Who is to deny that science can, cannot be done, or can be done in a supernaturally created world? Uh, according to the philosophy of science, science itself doesn't deal with the, uh, the reason why things came into existence. Uh, there can be supernatural reason for uh, the existence of the world. And so if uh, nature was created supernaturally, then we can still do science in a supernaturally created world. Um, also, uh, science has its origins in the Christian Europe, in the Middle Ages, but also in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. This is the biblical mandate for science. Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and it subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So the key here is that Adam must subdue the earth. And in order to do so, he must know and understand it. This is science. So God is telling Adam, be a scientist. What did Adam do? He became a taxonomist. And he named the animal. So science has its roots in the very first chapter of the Bible in Genesis. We creationists, we can be proud of this. Also, just um, a few words, because it's been in the news, Roe versus Wade has been overturned. God is good, God is love, uh, praise God. God created us in his image. God created life. God created all things very good without pain, suffering, disease, or death. And there's a great, um, you know, Roe versus Wade overturned means that more babies will be saved. As a human species, there's a big variety of human diversity. Also, there's a great diversity of biological life, which we shall now examine from a molecular perspective. Now, last time we left with this uh, picture here, and I asked uh, you, the audience, uh, do you think that these three animals, are they one kind or many kinds? Uh, one's a fish, shark, reptile, ichthyosaur, and then we have a mammal, which is a dolphin. And so morphological studies could classify these three animals into the same kind, into one big kind of, just look at, look at superficial uh, uh, morphological similarities, um, even though they are different classes of vertebrates, uh, we also learned yesterday that the level of the kind is around the family. And so the question is, how would we classify these organisms based on their DNA? So maybe the DNA is the key to understanding how we can better classify uh, these three animals, not into the same kind, but into separate kinds. So why molecular terminology? What is the impetus? What is the reason for this separate sub-branch of of Brahminology. Looks may deceive, as we saw previously, uh, two or three organisms from different groups may look alike, like the shark or the dolphin. So we can't separate them based on, or on physical traits. Rather, let's look at their DNA. We can maybe even, we can tell the difference based on their DNA. As we saw in uh, Nathan, Nathaniel Jensen's talk, there's a wide variety within a Brahmin, for example, in bovids. You know, there's a big variety of morphological similarity. So again, let's look at their DNA. Maybe you can see some very sharper boundaries between kinds based on their DNA. Also, there are missing morphological characters, incomplete skeletons, only cranial characteristics. There's a lot of incomplete uh, morphological data. What about microorganisms? We can't measure the cranial capacity of a bacterium. So let's look at it. Let's look at their DNA. And I have done several studies when I looked at archaea or bacteria or viruses, looking at their DNA sequences. And also it's important that your DNA determines your physical traits. Your genes determine proteins, which carry out functions in your cells. That is the genotype defines the phenotype. The genotype being your genetic makeup and your phenotype being your physical makeup. So our genes determine how we look, what, what we look like. So molecules, before morphology is an, is an important principle here in molecular biomonology. So what kind of data is out there that we can use for molecular biomonology studies? Now, bioinformatics is a 
very rapidly developing science, and that's an understatement. And I would highly encourage young Christian uh, college students, if you're studying biology, get into bioinformatics. There is a huge ton of data out there. It's lying there, hasn't been analyzed yet. You can get your fingers really dirty in analyzing this ton of data. Billions of sequences in the, in the public domain, all waiting to be analyzed by thousands of algorithms. The data is also accumulating faster than we can even analyze it. It's a big, huge field. As creationists, we have to harness uh, bioinformatics. Scientists are sequencing larger quantities of DNA with increasing speed and a decreasing cost. The human, the human Genome Project was, it was a billion dollars on the range of several billion, billion dollars, but now you can get yourself sequenced for a thousand dollars. That's how much the prices have dropped. This is really radical stuff. So as creation scientists, it's not a question of, it's a question of how we should make use of this data, not whether we should make use of the data. We need to make use of the data or get left behind. We really have to get uh, entrenched into bioinformatics. So just to show that this is a growth of GeneBank, which is a major uh, bioinformatics database. Here's the year 2000. And so we have data for 2008. You can see the exponential growth. It's a literal explosion of data. We have to make use of the data. This is a, a 2021 uh, um, uh, statistics. We have 215 million protein sequences. Uh, we have data for 115,000 organisms, lots of data out there. There's a number of genomes sequenced over time. Um, and it's only for 2014. Again, we see this, this exponential curve. In uh, 2022, there's even more, more genomes sequenced. I, keep, I have to keep on stressing that there's a ton of data out there. We have to lay our hands on it. So now let's talk about terminology and methods. The goals and terminology of molecular terminology are the same as morphological terminology. And for those of you who uh, are just listening now, a baramin is a, is a kind, it's a biblical kind. It's the term that we're going to use all the time to define a group of organisms that can interbreed with one another, but which do not interbreed with other, with other organisms, like cats are one kind, dogs are one kind, horses, there's the human kind. These are all kinds. Uh, they intermix with one another, but they don't uh, interbreed with other organisms. Molecular biology uses different data, different techniques, different technologies based on molecular biology. There's the gene content comparison, the whole genome sequence analysis. These are uh, algorithms that I myself have developed. And we also do mitochondrial and chloroplast genome sequence analysis. And I'll describe these things in detail as we go in the presentation. Here are just some summary papers. Uh, if you want to read more about these individual algorithms, maybe you can take a, a snapshot. Um, they've been published in several um, several creation journals. Also, uh, at least I think a couple of these were stealth publications, which were published in secular journals. Um, so uh, thoroughly scientific. Um, and so uh, what is the goal of molecular biomonology? There's a threefold goal to glorify God by cultivating science that honors him. First Corinthians 10, 31 says, therefore, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God, to think God's thoughts after him. We have a scientific uh, uh, program in the Bible. We want to discover the kinds of organisms that God has created in the living world. Only God knows what kinds there are, but as scientists, we also want to discover what, what these kinds are. We need to think God's thoughts after him. We also want to show that science speaks about the glory of God and not just random evolutionary chance, that we are intelligently, wonderfully created and designed. And also to show that the Bible has answers. As Christians, we can do uh, science as well as evolutionists, we're even better because we have the truth. I believe in this, I believe in this. We also want to point people to Christ revealed in the scripture, that the, that the scripture is actually and factually true not just about Genesis, but also about how you live your life, also about Christ. And so therefore we can share the gospel with other people. So what kind of molecular data uh, is, are there in the databases? There's a whole genome sequences uh, from the very first DNA letter to the last. The human genome is three billion letters. 
a uh, genome of a bacteria is about um, is about maybe one million uh, one million DNA letters. The genome protein sequences that we can analyze, we can compare with one another. There's mitochondrial and plastid DNA whole genome sequences from these cell organelles, which we can align with one another and cross compare between species. Uh, databases, there's NCBI, uh, which has whole genome sequences, organelle genome sequences, gene sequences. Uniprot is a protein database. There's a Galaxy server where you can uh, compare uh, protein content between two species. Now I'll talk about uh, in more depth about different methods of molecular repair monology. One is the whole genome KMER signature method. Uh, it's a method where we analyze uh, the DNA signature of these uh, DNA words, which are uh, which are distributed in in the whole genome sequences of different different species. There's the gene content method. We compare uh, the how um, what percent uh, of genes do two species have in common. If they're in the same family, they have a lot of genes in common. If not, they have a, a smaller common gene content. And there's mitochondrial genome sequence analysis, also chloroplast genome analysis. The first uh, algorithm, which uh, I'll talk about, is a whole genome KMERS signature algorithm. It has a long name. So we're studying the whole genome sequence. We're studying these short KMERS. KMER is a short stretch of DNA. Uh, the DNA letter is A, C, G, or T. Uh, KMER is K letters long. If you have a tetramerits, ACGT is a KMER of length four. And so the way we have to, we have to understand this is that uh, just as a, as a backup, um, this is a, an aside. If we look at different uh, literary genre, we have uh, magazines about, uh, about sports, which contain words such as score, stadium, team, or player. These are words which you would expect to encounter if you read a sports magazine or a, or a book on sports. If you talk about architecture, you'll find words such as building, bridge, engineer, or blueprint. These are vocabulary words which are very characteristic of, of uh, architecture books. Genetics, we'll read about a base pair, about uh, genomes, chromosomes, and mutations. We don't really expect to read about uh, scores, like soccer scores in a, in a book about genetics, neither do we expect to read about chromosomes in a book on architecture. So they're literary genres with a very specified professional uh, vocabulary. Now, how does this translate to, to genetics and the schema signature algorithm? The thing is that during creation week, God created different kinds, each with its, with, with, with its own created genome, also known as a baronome. Bereshit bara Elohim, but Shaman but Ayatse is a word Bereshit bara, which means he created. And so a created genome is a baronome. It's a special technical term uh, that um, Danish creationist uh, devised. Uh, and so a baronome, uh, at the very starting time point of creation, it is pristine, it is unaffected by deleterious effects of mutations, it is pluripotent. It is uncommitted and undifferentiated by mutations. That is, uh, through time, it can accumulate mutations in this genome, and then it can differentiate into the genomes of different species which make up that, uh, that, that brahmin. The genomes of species within a kind originate by mutational differentiation from the brahmin. And here is a picture whereby we can understand this process much better. This is a wolf, which is the Archibramen of the dog kind. It is the first original uh, species, according to um, Bermanology, that all other dog species came from uh, the wolf. And I think that that, uh, that even secular scientists admit that dogs form a monophyletic group, otherwise known as a Brahmin. And so the first um, species would be the wolf. Everybody started out from the wolf. And so then we have one branch leading to the coyote has several mutations in these, in these letters. Then we have uh, the St. Bernard with some more mutations in different positions. Another branch out to uh, the golden retriever, different mutations in different portions of the genome. And so the whole idea is, is that the, the archaic dog genome differentiates into the genomes of other dog species 
in the Dachind. So the idea is that we expect to find a very similar DNA signature in the genomes of all these dot species. There's going to be a very common DNA signature in the genomes of these individual species, which all belong to the same kind. If you look at cats or horses, there's going to be a different signature. We can detect this using statistical methods. But so going on, um, we will see that um, a DNA vocabulary word, a camer, is a short DNA segment. For example, here's C C G T G A C G. It's eight letters long. It is a it's an octamer camer. And so we can look at the distribution of these octamers in the genomes of these species. These words can be regulatory motives, structural or repeat elements. And so just as I mentioned the, about, about architecture and about sports and about genetics, just as with literary genres, species from different kinds each have a different, they have a different DNA vocabulary. They speak a different genetic language. Uh, from different kinds, the word con content correlates very poorly from different, different kinds. But if you have species from the same kind, they have a large overlap in their DNA vocabulary. They speak the same genetic language, same uh, very, very similar vocabulary. Their DNA word content will correlate very well. That's what we expect according to this model. And so indeed, again, this paper is a style publication published in, um, in the Secular Journal. And so what do, we, what do we see here? This is a square matrix. That is, it's a visualization of a square matrix with all these similarity values. And the values, they range from minus one to plus one. Uh, since we're measuring the correlation of uh, the DNA vocabulary between two species. So for example, uh, we see anopheles, these are mosquitoes, glossina or tsetse flies, drosophila or fruit flies. And the reason it's a, it's a symmetric square matrix is because if we take, let's say, two Anopheles species, let's say An Anopheles epiodicus and Anopheles merus, we see that it, it corresponds to a very bright yellow color. The bright yellow color, the brighter the color, means that it's closer to plus one. And in statistics, plus one is a very good correlation. It means that these two Anopheles species, their their, gen their DNA vocabulary co correlates very well with one another. They speak the same genetic language. These two species, they correlate very well, whereas Jos Josephila ananase and let's see Anopheles maculatus is a dark orange. The darker the color means that it's less correlated. And so a Josephila, a fruit fly, and a mosquito their DNA vocabulary will, will, be, will correlate very poorly. And this is where you can uh, differentiate, differentiate between species of the same kind and different kinds. So here we find a block of Anopheles, Glossina, Josephila. We see that each square is going to represent an individual kind. We see that species in this kind their DNA vocabulary correlates very well with one another. We have, we have this bright block, this, this bright, these bright colors here. Whereas if we compare species from different kinds, there's going to be a darker color and it'll be a very low correlation. So in this manner, we can, we can detect in individual kinds, which are very, very disjunct, very, very, very separate from one another in a very statistically significant manner. And this was first published in a secular journal, a first study of its kind. I also studied bats. I mentioned bats uh, yesterday, and uh, somebody asked, like, how many bat kinds are there? And um, um, I studied bats based on this algorithm, also on mitochondrial studies. And so we found that there are four uh, bat kinds. And of course, here, color schemes may vary. So in its color scheme, the red blocks correspond to higher similarity values. Um, I made these figures using, uh, using RStudio, and there are these different parameters as to what kind of coloration scheme I can use. Uh, the color scheme is value, but when we look at these images, we have to look at like different, um, we have to look at these blocks here. 
uh, we have to look at these blocks which correspond to different kinds. And so I also studied mammals, also another stealth publication. And so here's, it's very interesting. In mammals, I studied mustelids, which are like weasels or otters or, or minks, these kinds of animals. Also compared, compared them to bears and also cats or felids. And so the, the, the subject of this study was, uh, I was comparing the red panda, because it's a really interesting question. How do we classify the red panda? Ilurus fulgans is its Latin name. Uh, and before the age of molecular studies, uh, different um, taxonomists said it looks like a bear, it looks like maybe a cat, uh, maybe a raccoon. They weren't really sure as to how they had to classify this, this very interesting animal. So with the onset of molecular bear monology, we can look at its whole genome chemo signature, we can look at its DNA, and so we can find that this animal, it, 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 uh, it fits in with these other mustelid species. I would say that it looks very much like the, uh, the, American, um, the American mink, it's a Mustela americana. You can see that there is some sort of similarity, whitish head, red, red body color. Uh, and so according to this algorithm, uh, this animal fits in with different mustelid species. I would say that uh, that Ilurus fulgans, the red panda, is a mustelid. It is not. Uh, it is not a bear. This is Ilurupoda melanoica, which is the giant panda, uh, with its orange star. Uh, the giant panda fits in with all the other bears in the bear kind. Uh, some other uh, taxonomists they said it looks like a cat. I also studied cats. It's not a cat. The red panda is indeed. It's a mustelid according to, to this analysis. I also studied the whole genome came with signature of a lot of other uh, animals. Uh, I found, uh, we, uh, studied pinnipeds, which is this block right here. We have bears, dogs, uh, we have different, uh, we have three whale kinds. Here's a hippopotamus by itself. And lo and behold, we also have bovidae right here. Of course, uh, I did this study Independently of, of Dr. Jensen's analysis, I did not know he was going to talk about bovids, about the big variety of bovids. And as we saw yesterday, that we saw all these bovid species, we were tantalized as to where the boundary is, where the more morphological boundary is. So this really illustrates nicely that if we if we look at the DNA, we can find a sharp distinction between bovids and non-bovids. So we find that here is Capra Siberica, the Siberian ibex, which is a bovid, and also Ovis arias, the sheep. And so we were talking about the, the sheep and buffalo kind of all these other species. We have buffaloes, we have bison. This is a molecular evidence of the existence of the bovid kind. So independently, morphological studies and also molecular studies come to the same result. And this is really just a wonder of, of of creation science. Then uh, the next big algorithm is the gene content method. Uh, physical traits measure, measure things like body mass, number of fins, presence or absence of a particular bone. Um, now, now let's look at how many genes two species have in common. Genetic traits are also part of taxonomical descriptions in taxonomy class at college. You'd basically think that, you know, taxonomists, you look at, at wings or legs or cranial capacity but they, you can also look at like internal organs. We can also look at DNA characteristics. These are also part of how we describe uh, animals in a taxonomic, taxonomic, taxonomy study. So genes pr produce proteins, which uh, code for different traits. Genes which fulfill the same function in different species are called orthologs. So indeed, uh, we have genes in common with chimpanzees, with uh, horses, with dogs, even with yeast. And, uh, but of course, the more genes we have in common with, uh, with, uh, uh, with um, the more gen genes that two spe species have in common mean that they're, they're more closely related. It means that they're from the same kind. So let's measure the genetic similarity between two species based on how many similar genes they have, how many orthology groups they have. Now, I'm going to talk about uh, it's. A sort of a technical um, interlude. It's not a problem if you don't understand this. 
the basic concept is, is let's look at how many genes two species have in common. But we can measure this by looking at orthology groups. Uh, the gene content method assigns each gene or protein in a species proteome, that is all the proteins in a given organism, to a so-called orthology group. An orthology group is made up of several genes, virtually the same function for many different species. These genes differ ever so slightly in their sequence, very, very small uh, sequence dissimilarity, but the sequence difference uh, doesn't affect the protein's function. It's just a, a synonymous mutation. It doesn't affect the, the function of the protein. For example, there are alcohol dehydrogenases, cyclin Bs, or histone proteins. These, pro like histones, they, they, uh, they occur in all sorts of genomes, they have a function in in uh, in uh, uh, in the structure of the genome, um, like flies, frogs, uh, sheep, fish. They all have histone proteins in their genome. They all fulfill the same function for coiling the DNA around uh, themselves. Uh, uh, OG identifiers are listed, uh, and so therefore we're, we're comparing the, the orthology group ID content between two species. So just a picture of what is an orthology group. We have four clusters. These are NOx genes. There's NOx1, NOx2, NOx3, NOx4, and Fort Knox. And then we have um, and then we have this new protein. We don't know what it is. We don't know its function. And so we can take this protein sequence and compare it to all these orthology groups. And so we compare it to NOx1. Is it a NOx1? Um, NOx2? Um, Knock, knock, who's there? Uh, and then there's, uh, and there, is it an OX3? Whatever group it'll be most similar to, it'll be assigned to that orthology group. So we take this protein and then we'll give it an, an orthology group identifier. So now this was the technical part. Uh, it's really not, not so important. If you don't really fully understand it, it's not a problem. The main idea is, is we're measuring the, the, the gene content similarity between two species. And so how do we do that? We measure this Jacquard coefficient value. And so if we see on uh, the Venn diagram here, we have two species, species A and species B. We have the intersect of their, their gene content. So A is the number of genes in species A, B, the number of genes in species B, and then A intersect B is the number of common genes and then a union B is a union of gene content between species A and B. And so here's the equation for the Jaggard coefficient value. It's basically the intersect divided by the union of all, of all the genes in these two species. It's gonna ha have a value between zero and one. And of course, if we have two species from the same ramen, we have a high overlap in the gene content, high proportion of similar genes. And so the JCV value is close to one. These are two species from the same Brahmin. If you have two, uh, two species from different Brahmins, there's only a very slight overlap. And the two uh, species might even have a very disparate number of genes in their genome. So this is how we tell based on this model, whether two species belong to the same Brahmin or two different Brahmins based on this algorithm. So I studied this first in NCLDVs. That's just an acronym. Uh, NCLDVs are very interesting organisms, they're highly interesting. They are nucleocytoplasmic large DNA viruses, such as these ones. They're not Kush balls. So um, some people think that they're very degenerated uh, bacteria. Some people think they're viruses. I think that they are actually bacteria, not, not really viruses, just like their names. As a comparison, here is the rhinovirus, here is the HIV virus, a very, very large uh, size difference between different viruses. I think that basically because of the size and the size of their genome, they have a one megabase per genome, one million DNA letters. I think they're, they're really uh, bacterial. HIV has a genome of 10,000 letters, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, SARS CoV 2 has 30,000 DNA letters. And so what I did was, again, we have a uh, heat map or a dark map. And so here we can see that there are five groups, five clusters with at least three species. 
we have this group here, we have another group, and then we have five these five groups here with at least three constituent species. So we can see that we've discovered five putative uh, NCLDV power balance. But now we also, I also did this for Archaea, 160 species. And based on this analysis, I found eight holobramins based on the basic chemical that they metabolize, uh, methane, either sulfur, nitrogen, uh, metabolism, or salt ions, holophiles. What this means is that we have these eight groups here, and they each metabolize either methane, carbon, or sulfur, or nitrogen. The idea is that um, the physio physiological processes which metabolize methane or sulfur are very, very fundamentally different from one another, so much so that, that uh, let's say, a methane uh, uh, metabolizing archaea cannot just simply transform into a sulfur metabolizing archaea via random mutations. The pathways and the, and the regulatory pathways and the genes that are involved in the process of, of using methane are very, very, very different from those which which use salt ions or nitrogen or sulfur. So archaea, it seems they're, they're different. They differ based on their basic metabolism. And so we have these eight groups in archaea. In insects, we have 100 more species. We have, to, we have five groups from Lepidoptera, which are butterflies, Hemiptera, which are bugs, Hymenoptera, which are, um, I think, uh, ants and, and bees. To, I think two dipterans, which are flies. We have these five groups in insects. In primates, we have uh, humans, new world monkeys, and old world monkeys. Uh, and also in these analyses, I also uh, added some outlier groups. For comparison, we have Monodophis, which is a possum mouse, just to show that, uh, uh, that, that these outliers, we should expect to see great differences between outlier species and the species that we're, that we're studying. That's the role of outlier species to demonstrate real true differences, which we, which we can compare bound differences to. There's, there's also mitochondrial genome analysis. Um, a mitochondrial DNA or empty DNA is a very short uh, DNA sequence, about 16 to 20,000 uh, base pairs. It's easy to isolate. Uh, mitochondria is very abundant in the cells, the little batteries of the cell. So cells need energy uh, in order to live and thrive. Uh, they're also very easy to sequence, and so therefore they've generated a lot of mitochondrial DNA sequences for a lot of organisms, for 24,000 different uh, species at NCBI database. The downside is that the mitochondrial DNA represents only a, a very small fraction of the entire genome. So you can draw some conclusions from mitochondrial analysis, but you can't really generalize to the whole entire the whole entire genome, but it's still, you know, easy and useful to, to analyze mitochondrial genomes. And so what we do is we take the, the empty DNA sequence from all the species in a study, we do a multiple alignment, and then from the multiple alignment, we can calculate the sequence similarity between any two given uh, sequences slash species. So for example, uh, so again, this is the cell, and the, just as our body, we have different uh, organs like hearts, livers, brains, etc. The cell has different organelles, like uh, the nucleus or like the Golgi apparatus, where the endoplasmic reticulum is a mitochondria. And in the mitochondria, you can see that there is the mitochondrial DNA. Here's a bigger picture showing that it's 16,000 base pairs long, with about 37 uh, different genes in the mitochondrial genome. And so this here is a multiple alignment. These are for human individuals. And so as you can see that here's a sequence, and you can see that at certain positions, there are differences. There's T's and A's and G's, but there are also large swaths of sequence similarity. We have GTT, TAT, GTAG, which is pretty invariant in uh, this mitochondrial study of primates. And so if we take two species, we can then simply compare the DNA sequence and see how many positions they are similar at. And so we can calculate a, uh, a mitochondrial DNA sequence similarity value. And so in primates, what, uh, I uh, took all these sequences, about 30, 30 different species, they found we have, uh, we have HOMO, 
which is humankind. And we found Homo sapiens Neanderthalensis. We found Homo sapiens Altai, which is Denisovan. We found Homo heidelbergensis, uh, which is a fossil human. Very interesting that they were able to isolate DNA from these fossils. Um, Svante Pebo, he studied Neanderthals, the Neanderthal genome. We actually took Svante Pebo's uh, DNA data. Uh, his group actually sequenced Neanderthal and Denisovan. They se sequenced these two archaic humans. And our group at UNMC in Nebraska Medical Center, we assembled their, their DNA puzzle pieces into the whole genome sequence. That's what we did in our group. And so here we have also of pan paniscus, we have the two chimpanzees, we have gorilla, separate group, and we have pongo, um, and then we have hylobatus, then we have mocax, we have six different primate groups, we have lemurs as an out group. And so I think that um, uh, they isolated this empty DNA from fossils. We can still tell that Homo heidelbergensis is human based on its high similarity with other humans based on its mitochondrial genome sequence. And so again, um, the sequence similarity be between chimps and humans, here, here are the two chimps, here are humans, it's a dark orangish, but the sequence similarity is only 90%, not 99% as evolutionists purport. And also it's very interesting that, that with, uh, before this, this uh, DNA data from Homo heidelbergensis, uh, creationists hypothesize based on morphology alone that Heidelbergensis is human based on their bone shape, based on physical traits. And now the molecular uh, results also reinforces the same result. So here morphological bermanology and molecular bermanology are a nice, nice agreement with one another. Has a very outstanding result. Uh, I also studied pinnipeds. We have uh, uh, three families, Otaridae, Odobenidae, Phocidae, and Mosinidae. It's, it's an outgroup found that, that uh, seals, Phocidae, are one Brahmin. Walrus is its one single species in its own Brahmin. And we have fur seals and sea lions in a third pinniped Brahmin. So as I mentioned yesterday, pinnipeds are an apple Brahmin. They do look similar to one another. But when, when we look at their DNA, we're able to discern three putative um, pinniped holograms. We have the seals, walruses, and sea lions. These are the three groups based on this analysis. We also, I also looked at cephalopods. We have uh, several squid groups. We have octopodidae, we have octopuses. Uh, octopuses are a hologram, hologram with, with a very, uh, very highly uh, characteristic uh, morphology. I also found cuttlefish uh, and also nautilus and or argonaut. Here's Danny Rear, it's a fish species as an outlier. Um, and so I discovered these seven putative programmings among cephalopods. Uh, yes. Um, can you define holobaram uh, again? So holobaram, a holobaram, there's a word holos and baramin. Yeah. As it means the whole baramin. A holobramin is the complete exhaustive list of species in a created kind. It's like the full list, the full roster of all the species that exist in a holobramin. It's the whole baramin. It's a holobramin. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. So these color bars, they each represent an individual holobramin. Now, of course, the, 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 uh, um, these colors designate different holobramins. But of course, we might not have discovered all existing species in a holobramin. It's just that with, uh, um, with molecular methods, we have to delineate and separate holobramins from one another. And again, like I said, that in the future, we, we might be able to breed new species that will belong to the same holobramin. Now, uh, another study that I did, my most recent publication where study is the molecular bramanic placement of Homo heidelbergensis. We saw results that it, it is human. Homo heidelbergensis has been classified as an archaic human according to morphology studies. It has erectine jaws, teeth, body size, and locomotion, meaning that uh, it shares traits with Homo erectus fossils. Homo erectuses are also humans. 
has a crane haul capacity, the Cowboy 1 fossil of 1325 cubic centimeters, which is in the lower, the lower range of modern humans. But also very interestingly, that besides the mitochondrial DNA, it also has nuclear DNA as well. Neanderthals, they, they isolated um, uh, nuclear DNA for Neanderthal. They also found uh, a small amount of uh, nuclear DNA for Homo heidelbergensis as well. And so I, what I did was I compared this DNA data that they had for heidelbergensis with a known archaic so-called Paleolithic human. And so the idea was that I, I compared the Homo heidelbergensis DNA fragments, aligned them to the human genome and also the chimp genome, and also reads from archaic Paleolithic human, also to the human, human genome and also to the chimp genome. And so I calculated a variant density ratio, and it's a bit technical, so it's not a problem if you, if you don't understand, but uh, basically if um, the more substitutions there are between two sequences, the larger the genetic difference, uh, meaning two different parameters. But if there are less mutations, if, the, if there's a smaller difference, it means that these two sequences come from the same ramen. So if we, ha if we have a lot of mutations which separate two DNA sequences, it means that uh, the average distance between the two uh, mutations is very short. This is a case where the, where, where, uh, where the two sequences, where they come from different parameters. Um, and so again, variant density is inversely proportionate to the average length between two mutations in the DNA. If we compare chimpanzees with humans, we have a lot of mutations between the two genomes. Whereas if we compare uh, to human sequences, then there are fewer mutations and the, and the average length between two mutations is larger. So these are two different Brahmins, these are the same Brahmin. And so uh, variant densities were very similar between Homo heidelbergensis and Paleolithic man when mapping to human and chimp genomes, meaning that um, when we look at uh, these different, um, th these two methods of matching these DNA sequencing reads, the pattern is very highly similar between Homo heidelbergensis and archaic Paleolithic man, meaning that Homo heidelbergensis is really another archaic human individual. So anyway, moving forward, uh, besides the mitochondrial DNA, they've also, they also have a lot of uh, chloroplast genome, uh, genome sequences at NCBI. The chloroplast is another uh, cell organelle in plants. It's responsible for photosynthesis, capturing energy from the sun, turning in, uh, and using it to make sugars. Uh, and this is a chloroplast. It, uh, here's its internal um, anatomy. And in these, uh, uh, in these membranes, in these uh, thylakoid membranes, we have um, the, those enzymes which are responsible for using um, solar energy to transform it into energy that the, the cell can use to produce sugars. And so in the chloroplast, we have uh, the chloroplast genome. It's about 10 times the size of mitochondrial DNA. We can also use chloroplast for analysis in verminology studies. Um, it's a bit harder to use uh, than mitochondrial genomes simply because of its size. I did a study in Liliales, which are lily species. And so here's another heat map for different Liliale species. We can uh, see that there are, again, several groups, several, uh, several Brahmins within this larger taxonomical group of Liliales. We have Paris and Trillium, Beatrum, uh, Amena and Tulipa, Tulips. We have Lilies, Lilium, and then we have some, some smaller groups and individual species. So using chloroplast uh, genome sequences, we can uh, find different putative uh, groups within Liliales. I think Liliales, it's on the level of order. So we have several Brahmins within this order of, of plant species. Uh, we can also look at uh, organelle DNA. Um, 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 uh, I looked at this hypothesis that within a kind, um, the mitochondrial genome um, the following mitochondrial genome factors are uh, fairly invariable. 
the gene inventory is the same. They have the same 37 gene sequences. The gene order is also preserved in uh, uh, between um, within the same ramen. The genome is also the same length, also pretty much the same length, uh, same uh, genome size. And so we should be able to tell the difference between two different Brahmins based on these mitochondrial DNA characteristics. So on this figure here, what we can see is that um, each one of these bars, I'm sorry, uh, they represent one species. This bar represents the mitochondrial genome of, of the species. And these different colored segments, they correspond to different genes. Here's a list of the genes with the corresponding colors. So based on the color, you can tell the order of the genes in the mitochondrial genome. So uh, in the cluster one, we have, we have nautiluses. We have three nautilus species at the top. Then we have two argonauts. Uh, these are two separate Brahmins because uh, their genome length is, uh, is fairly similar. The order of the genes is also largely similar. It's also the gene order is very different from that of other, other Brahmins. Here we have octopuses. Then we have three squid groups. Then we also have cuttlefish at the bottom, and here's Danieria, which is an outlier species. So based on the genome length, the DNA similarity, and also the gene order of the genes in the mitochondrial genome, we see, we find, uh, we, have, we have several different uh, groups within cephalopods. Cephalopods, uh, meaning it's, it's a group of mollusks, uh, such, as, such as cuttlefish, octopuses, and squids. So uh, molecular biomimology methods, uh, there are several advantages. There's a ton of data in the databases from NCBI, SwissPrat, or other different uh, databases. Um, mitochondrial DNA genomes are also easy to isolate and quick to sequence. We can also study microorganisms. We cannot really study the morphology of, of bacteria or viruses. Um, it's also not sensitive to convergent morphology. If we remember uh, the shark, the ichthyosaur, and also the dolphin, we can we can tell that these three species they belong to different different kinds. There are some dis disadvantages uh, to these methods. If we have missing hypothetical or low quality proteins, uh, um, there's also missing uh, molecular biomimicry is also plagued by missing data. Uh, genomes might also suffer from low coverage if they're not sequenced well enough. There might be missing or ambiguous uh, sequences, missing DNA letters, uh, and also the mitochondrial DNA sequence is only a very short sequence. It's not as representative as the whole genome sequence. And then what is the future of molecular biomimology? Uh, since we have lots and lots of data in the databases, we can um, more and more see, uh, species studies can be uh, made possible. We can do all sorts of, uh, of, of biomimology studies with, 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 with uh, this, this ton of data that we have. Um, until now, only one or two chloroplast genome analyses have been done. Um, and there have been a lot of mitochondrial studies, uh, but we can also examine uh, chloroplast genomes and we can study plant molecular biomimology. Um, the gene content method uh, has to be fine-tuned. Um, we can do some, uh, some fine-tuning here, uh, parameterizing uh, the different uh, protein comparison algorithms, what counts as a protein orthologue. Um, this might be a bit too, too technical, but um, there's a lot of work to be done in molecular biomimology. We have some algorithms that we can, we can make use of, but we, we still need to, uh, to fine tune them so that we can have more precise predictions of what kind of holograms there are uh, using these molecular uh, methods. And so uh, that's it for this talk. And thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, then please feel uh, free to ask. This was, was I feel much more technical than the previous talk, but um, I just want really, really to illustrate that that as creation scientists, we can do really high level technical science, which can match the level of evolutionary biologists. And as I, as you can see that that uh, a couple of these studies were actually published first in secular papers. And then a subsequent creation paper was written about the same subject. 
So just uh, really to um, keep the faith that that, uh, that the, the data really does um, support the creation worldview and not evolution. Matthew, let me begin with a question that was online, if I may. This question is, is there anything that shows that the coefficient, JCD, maybe you're talking about the Chicard score. Yeah, coefficient. Coefficient. yeah. Is there any uh, anything that shows that the coefficient, what the coefficient is between each and all different species, including across polar bear Um, uh, Could you repeat the question? Sure. Yeah. Is there anywhere that shows what the coefficient is between each and all different species, including across polar bear mammals? Okay. Um, if I um, if I understand the question correctly, um, is there like a gold standard value which can separate species from uh, in, into different or the same ramen, mm -hmm. like a special cutoff? Uh, there is no such golden uh, jacket coefficient value number. Rather, it's very specific to individual studies. So uh, I admit that, that uh, the method does have this kind of shortcoming that, that you know, if you take any two species from, from the databases, if you look at their, 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 their gene content, and if you calculate a jacket coefficient value, uh, you cannot really tell just generally if they're in the same Brahmin or different Brahmins. It really uh, depends on the study that you're making. Like when I made these heat maps, um, then I did these heat maps in R, and R uses uh, these clustering methods. Based on the clustering method that I use, uh, we can show uh, it can be shown that uh, that different species they cluster into different groups. That we see sharp distinctions between individual Brahmins in these heat maps. The way we detect um, the significance of these Brahmins is when we calculate a p-value. We look at uh, the similarity within a group and we compare them to values uh, between species from that group and from all the other species in the study. So we have two sets of correlation values or two sets of, of jacket coefficient values. We just do a t-test. We can measure how statistically significantly different these two value sets are. And we can say that if it's below 5%, then we have a uh, statistically significant uh, brand. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Where do evolutionists get this 99% uh, uh, similarities between humans? And oh, between humans and chimps. Yeah. Let me repeat the question so those online can hear it too. So the question is, how does the evolution model get to this 99% similarity in human and chimp genome? And then, we see, and then the creationist is what, between 90? It's about 90%, others put it at 80%. And so when they sequenced the chimpanzee genome, uh, like I said, that uh, that uh, they assumed that uh, humans and chimpanzees are related, so they were looking for like a very high, uh, very high match between chimpanzees and humans, and so they looked at those regions which uh, in which there was a high level of similarity, and so indeed that's where you see this 99 percent similarity, but if you look at the regions where there's where the where, where the bigger differences are, where there's no match between the human and the chimpanzee chromosome, that lowers the similarity value down to 90%. If we, if you remember the, uh, if we, if we go back to um, the DNA um, heat map for humans, for primates, we see that um, here are the two chimpanzees, uh, and we see they form one group, and here are humans. We can see that this, this darker orange color, uh, it corresponds to uh, similarity values of like 90%. So if we compare modern human and chimpanzees, the percent similarity is only 90.7% when, when we look at the mitochondrial DNA. In other words, it's starting out with the biases. Yes, yes, yes. It's sort of cherry picking the data. Okay. Yes, uh, in the back. Yeah, and this maybe goes more back to yesterday. Yeah. But when we define a barrowman, right, whether that's molecularly or whether that's morphologically, right, we find lions and tigers are in the same barrowman. 
I wasn't clear yesterday. Does that mean that God created only one, right? God didn't make lions and tigers on day six. He made ligers that then became lions and tigers. Or was that just on the ark that there were ligers that became lions and tigers? Or how do I how do I correspond this idea of Barriman with what what do we see today? Well, with what God made, or what do we say? Right. That God oh, yeah, made? That's a, the question is how do we correspond Barriman or Baraman to what God actually made? How is this helping us find out what the original created kind was? Right. So that's a very good question. And so, as to what kind of uh, cat species were there in the beginning during creation week, we don't exactly know. Uh, I think we can assume that uh, their genomes were much more, you know, complete. If we look at, let's say, sand cats, they're, they're the smallest uh, cat species in the world. Um, they're, they're sort of like at the, at the end stage of cat uh, speciation, sort of like poodles. Poodles are very small. They're, they have uh, immune, um, immune diseases. Sand cats also have immune diseases. Um, and so um, we only know about humans that there were two human individuals during creation week, Adam and Eve, it may be possible that there were a hundred cats uh, created on day six, maybe a thousand, maybe 10,000. We know that uh, the birds, they, the, you know, that the, the seas, they swarmed with fish and that multitudes of birds, they, they flew across the firmament of the heavens. So it may be that God created a million birds or maybe 50,000 birds. We don't know the number. We don't know what kind of species there were originally. Uh, we can try to guess, and so, like I said, that the wolf uh, may have been the archibraman of the dog kind. Um, also, when you look at pigeons, um, I think it's called the stone pigeon. Darwin himself writes that uh, in the origin of, I think, the origin of species that all pigeons they come from from uh, from the from the stone pigeon, and. Um, so it may be that there were more individuals uh, um, uh, in, a, in a Brahmin. Uh, and when God, when there was the flood, God, obviously, he took two of each kind onto the ark so that after the flood, he would be able to, to, um, to help save the animal species through the flood by, by taking representatives of each kind. And so... You know, like the flood, it's sort of like a second creation, and like Noah's like a second Adam, that uh, just as species uh, were differentiated after creation, so they also differentiated after the flood. As to whether they were the same, whether they looked exactly the same as in creation and also during the flood, we don't know. I, I think it's likely that they were, they were, they look different. Um, like, for example, tigers and lions and like ligers and laligers and Pelagons, um, we see these species today. So I think that, that uh, tigers and ligers, these these cat species, they would be the they would be the the end product of variation within the cat kind that we see today. But what uh, what kind of cat species were there earlier? Uh, we don't really know. We just have fossils. So just like uh, Nathaniel Jensen said that that uh, we have lots of uh, like seventy five percent of species went extinct. There are all sorts of very, very interesting, uh, there's a wide variety of, of also extinct organisms in the past. Just to, I'm sorry, does that mean that you would say that there could be more than one Archie experiment? Right, because got maybe there were wolves and there were jackals on day six, and those are within the same barrament, well, but he made two different. Well, whether they were, they were wolves or jackals, I don't really know. Yeah, but I, um, but possibly, possibly, we, we can't, we do, we don't know, uh, we don't know exactly the thoughts of God that He had during creation week. Uh, Adam and Eve, we know for sure, two humans in the beginning, but um, but yeah, I mean, again, if we look at the humankind. Uh, we shouldn't uh, practice the arrogance of modernity that we define all of humanity based on on modern humans alone. Like because Homo erectus, Neanderthals, uh, Denisovan, and Homo heidelbergensis, these archaic humans, they're also humankind. So Noah could have looked different from us. Adam could have also looked different from us, like slightly different, but we could recognize that that he was human.
Can I repeat yes. that question? Because it's a very, excuse me, it's a very insightful question and comment there. What's being asked is, was the original, were there just two, was there a mating pair originally created by God? And that is the Ark Barrowman type, or were there multiple within that? So that's a very good question. Yeah. Certainly we know that at that bottleneck, at that funnel of the Ark, there were for most of them just two. So that would be the archetype of the modern yeah, things. Yeah. Yeah. So the archetype, the archetype, uh, I think, very likely does not coincide with the created, uh, created, created kind. There's no differences between the two. So Sorry. yes, you had a question. For um, a biblical taxonomy, it seems um, that First Corinthians fifteen, verse thirty-nine, is really foundational. That's where it says all flesh is not the same flesh, but there is one kind of flesh of men, another flesh of beasts, another of fishes, and another of birds. And I have so many questions to ask you, but I got to try to think of this one right. that, um, you know, tries to connect up what you're saying with that. Yeah. So... And to me, it was really striking that it does talk about uh, the flesh of fishes and another bird, and they were both created on the same day. That's kind of interesting. But um, what I was wondering is um, how any of these algorithms that are really created by man, how they incorporate this for starters um that there's a different flesh and between in this case fish and birds uh and if any of these genome um investigations i mean they seem to not even consider this it's as if all the molecules genes everything boils down to kind of the same evolutionary you know, same kind of stuff when the Bible teaches that there is actually very different flesh. And what are they, what does the Bible mean by flesh? Is it the molecular structure, the DNA, or what? The question is relating 1 Corinthians 15, different flesh, and how will Matthew respond to that with his studies? Okay, so uh, the verse that you brought is very, very interesting. It's very useful. And if we look at the text, it mentions beasts fish and birds and this is a it's a hebrew it's a, not a hebrew but it's it's a, a merism meaning, meaning that we have birds of the air that's one environment we have beasts of the field which is a dry land we have fish of the sea which is the marine aquatic realm so i would interpret this verse as saying that there are different kinds of animals in the different living spheres we have aerial uh, creatures we have uh, and you know the hebrew word for flying creatures is off and so the flying creatures such as birds and bats were created on day five so uh, here i think what this verse is mentioning is that that uh, the animals that we see in the sea in the air and on the, on the, on the dry land they are different flesh they are different kinds uh humans are, are also a separate flesh and a separate kind they're not related to fish or animals or whatever so it, we don't have an inner fish as that evolution said yesterday so we can forget that idea and so um so the verse which you brought is very useful for barmanology uh, it, it it just reinforces what genesis one says that that the, uh, that uh, that the, these different groups these different kinds they reproduce each according to their kind like plants there are herbs, there are trees, there are bushes, there are really different kinds of plant species which multiply within their own kind. And so really uh, my two talks, um, you know, of course, we have these algorithms, we do all these studies, but we're finite. I have to stress that as, as, a, as a scientist, as a, as a creationist, we hold to the Bible very strictly but we hold to these algorithms very loosely. These algorithms might be incorrect. So we hold to Sola Scriptura, that uh, these are just my ideas. I'm trying to, in my own finite um, 
sinful way. I'm trying to understand what kind of uh, kinds God created during creation week. Uh, and so um, these might have to be revised. I mean, we're actually in the process of revising the gene content method to make it uh, give more precise results. But so basically, when we look at uh, morphology, when we look at genes, we're trying to find sharp distinctions between between kinds. That kind resembles kind, and it's it's visually sharply distinct from other kinds. Because when Adam he named when he named the animals, God brought all the animals and as a good taxonomist, since everybody is a theologian and everybody is a scientist, Adam with his his level of scientific knowledge, he was able to tell the difference between bears and horses and bovids and camels and, and, and different kinds of animals. And so um, that's it's really uh, um, the name of the game in bermanology is whatever data that you're using, we try to find uh, statistical, mathematically significant differences between kinds. And yes. About well, 40 years ago, about the time you were born, I remember reading an article on Scientist in American about a chemical reaction where they reproduce uh, chemicals so that that's where I think they started this analyzing of being able to analyze DNA because it, whatever gene is, it multiplies so many of them so they end up with the ability to extract them in the laboratory. And my question, uh, I guess, is uh, how many levels of technology is there between what we actually see? And the question arises in my mind when you talk about getting DNA from these fossils, uh, like mitochondrial DNA is part of the cell. A fossil, how does it have a cell when it's all ossified? It's all made into stone, where do you get mitochondrial DNA from the fossils? Okay. The, the question deals with, the second part at least, how do I get DNA from fossils? And the first part dealt with some of the technical aspects of actually extracting it. Actually extracting. Okay, uh, so as a bioinformatician, um, I worked only very, very little in, in, a, in a lab. So I, I sit in front of a, a computer and I write programs all day long. But I can see a few things about how they isolated DNA from Neanderthal bones. Uh, so basically when you do DNA extraction, let's say RNA extraction, you have to take your samples, you have to break down the cells, you have to break down, let's say the, the cell junctions which exist between cells, you have to break apart the cell wall, you have to use all these, these uh, lytic enzymes, lysis means that you break something down, you have to use these enzymes which break down all these components, then um, you have to, I mean, you, they, they use all sorts of chemicals to like really break away the cell membrane, all the other uh, cell organelles, and then break apart, let's say, the, the nuclear envelope. And then they can use all sorts of buffers to, to contain the, the, you know, the DNA in, in a, in a buffer-like solution. But as to Neanderthal, uh, Svante Pebo heard a book on how he did this whole process. Now, first of all, has to be uh, very um, um, very sterile conditions. So like when they're doing the isolation, they have to have like a hazmat suit. They have to go through multiple doors into a special room where there's vacuum. They, if they if they breathe into the sample, their you know their skin cells they breathe their own modern human DNA into the sample and it, and it contaminates. Contamination is a big huge problem. And so, but you see the thing is that the fossils are young. They're not millions of years old. So, you know, they've also shown uh, DNA and red blood cells and soft tissue in dinosaur bones. So organic tissues uh, are, very, are quite common in dinosaur bones and, and in, in these archaic fossils. So there can still be like remnants either of the DNA or possibly osteocytes, you know, like bone cells in these bone tissues. Um, and uh, they just have to be like, very, very careful as to how they, how they uh, treat these bones because some of these fossils, you touch them and they, they get powderized instantly. 
So you have to handle these fossils with extreme care. Now they've shown that uh, when they isolate these DNA fragments, they get these DNA read sequences. Now, generally, when I work with, uh, with read sequences, these sequencing reads are about 150 or 200 or 300 base pairs long. But in archaic DNA, they may be 35 DNA, uh, base pairs long or 50 maximum, like very fragmented since they have been broken down ever since, you know, the ice age, um, whenever the Neanderthal died, you know, there's been decomposition, it's out in the wild. And so these DNA fragments are very short, but still they're able to uh, they're able to sequence these short DNA fragments. And then what our goal is, is that if, the, if we have these DNA fragments, these short pieces, or like uh, jigsaw puzzles, um, Svante Pievo's group, they, he sequenced these, uh, these short DNA sequence uh, reads. And what we did at the, at, at the University of Nebraska is we, we actually assembled a jigsaw puzzle. They provided the puzzle pieces. We assembled the jigsaw puzzle. Basically, that's what we did. And basically, that's how they, they isolate DNA sequences from, from organic samples. But then, I, but then again, I'm a programmer. I don't work in the lab, so this is what I can say. <laughs>